Welcome to the Spirit Centered Business Podcast, where we blend the spiritual with the practical for supernatural results. Now, here is your host, Berlin Newby. All right, there. Welcome back to Spirit Centered Business. I'm with Lemuel Adabambo. Lemuel Adabambo. <laughs> I just love that name. Thank you so much for part two. And if you guys missed part one, do make sure you go to spiritcenteredbusiness.com and click that podcast button to make sure that you get the first part because Lemuel talked all about kingship and we had some great conversation about that. And this segment, we're going to be talking about those offices and the archetypes of kingship. So well, I'm just going to give you the floor because I am totally a student here. I love what you're teaching. Thank you. It's it's good to be back. Uh, on, on the last uh, episode, we talked about kingship and stuff, but I think what I really love about the, not just the office of a king, but all the offices, as I was saying in the last episode, is that these offices um, are, how do I say this? You know, when you think about the executive positions in a company, whether it's the CEO, mm -hmm. the CEO, and so forth, they actually mirror offices in the kingdom of God. So I think the the blueprint of heaven is in almost everything that we do on earth. And, and that really gets me excited. So when I when I when I go to a company or I'm trying to learn about a company, I'm going, you know, how does that blueprint fit into the structure or how are they trying to implement heavenly structure into this? And sometimes they do it without knowing what they're doing really. But at the end of the day, all these things, you know, point back to heaven. So when I think of these offices, I, what I do is I group them into two categories. So there, there's what I call pillar offices and then supporting offices. So the pillar offices are four in number uh -huh. and they're mentioned in Colossians chapter one, I believe it's verse 16. So it speaks of uh, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Now, what was I've that again? Colossians? 116. 116. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So it speaks of thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. And I've heard different takes on that. My take on it is that thrones are kings, dominions are lords, principalities are princes, and powers are gods. And so you have those four offices that are pillar offices, meaning that they're, they're, they're at the core or foundation of the governmental structure of heaven. And then we have supporting offices. So we have chancellors, judges, oracles, legislators, scribes, and watchers. So the supporting offices are six in number. The pillar offices are four. So we have a total of 10 offices. And then when you go and look at the structure of our father's king, you find that there are also 10 courts. And so for every office, there is a court. Mm -hmm. um, and these courts are essentially places where those who function in these offices go to deliberate on matters and you know do cases and so forth but th these are the two categories of offices now the pillar offices i call them rulership offices um, and the reason is because typically those who function in these offices are either rulers of people uh and territories or just rulers of people so there are some princes for example who um, by rule, I mean, they lead, right? They're, they're princes who just lead groups of people, whether it's in the thousands, hundreds, fifties, or tens. And then there's some who actually rule territories. So to go a little bit deeper into, you know, we were talking about kingship archetypes. Um, the same way we have kingship archetypes, we have princeship archetypes, right? Um, there are four of them. So we have what the Bible calls kings of glory. There's what the Bible calls kings of righteousness. And then we have kings of peace. Now, the thing is that kings of glory, kings of glory are two. So there are, I would say, two kings of glory archetypes. And these four archetypes uh, stem from the four covenants that God made in the Old Testament. So there's God's co uh, the covenant that he made with Adam, the covenant he made with Noah, the covenant he made with Abraham, and the covenant he made with David. And so from these four uh, covenants stem these four kingship archetypes. So where there's four kingship archetypes, we also have four princeship archetypes. So let's think about uh, Pharaoh. Pharaoh, every king usually falls under one of these four archetypes. 
And, and one of the reasons this is really important is because, you know, people would ask, you know, why is it important to know about these archetypes? It's because a lot of the things we do in life, whether it's uh, the president, the presidency of the United States or any given country, every president falls under one or more of these archetypes. You know, so when we're voting for a king or a president, one of the things I do is I go, what kingship archetype does this king embody? And the reason is because each archetype has their strengths, their weaknesses. You know, we have kings of peace. They, they tax people. I mean, they raise taxes. So wherever you have a king of peace, you, you can rest assured that your taxes are going to go sky high. You think about Solomon. Um, Solomon, his name means peace, peaceful. And God made it clear that he was going to be a king of peace. Well, in the days of Solomon, the taxes were sky high. <laughs> so, you know, when voting for, for a president, that's one thing you consider, like, okay, what kind, what archetype is this king? Well, if he is a king of peace, or if you will, a president of peace, in other words, if he embodies that, uh, the characteristics of that archetype, that's something you can expect. Um, when kings of peace show up, they rule and they they often form alliances. That's one of the reasons why they're called kings of peace because they the way that they expand their territory or their rule is through alliances. And so you think about Solomon, we think about the fact that he had, what was it? 700 Seven. wives or something like that and 300 I don't know about 700, but wow, yeah, a lot. <laughs> a lot, right? A lot. You think about it, all those wives were princesses and, and what he was doing, I mean, there's more to what he was doing there, but at the base level, he was forming alliances to increase his rule. That, yeah. That's really what he was doing. So th these kings of peace, they're really big on alliances. That's how they expand. Now you, you, you go, okay, how is that practical to what we do in business? Well, uh, some people are called to be kings of peace as it relates to their business structure or their business model, which means that their business is going to require alliances. So if I'm trying to start a business, one of the questions I'm going to ask, ask myself is, okay, what uh, kingship archetype is necessary for this business model? That will help me or that will inform the kinds of things that I do that is going to help me expand my business. So if I'm into technology, for example, um, kings who, you know, I think of the Elon Musk of the world. Um, these are guys who require a great deal of alliances. And sometimes their alliances are not public. Sometimes they're private. But those alliances become the one of the, the strongest building blocks to whatever it is that they're building. So we have this kingship archetypes, but then you also have friendship archetypes. Uh, where there's a pharaoh, you have to have a Joseph, a prince who mirrors that king's archetype. So if there's a king of glory, you got to have a prince of glory who can help you rule. If you have a CEO, you got to have a COO. <laughs> and that COO has to have your mindset, your vision. He has to carry uh, your heart and so forth. So there's so much that we can go into when it comes to these archetypes, kingdom offices. But um, I'll just leave it there. And, you know, if you have any questions, we can get to them. Wow. Well, that makes so much sense as far as um, the, the personality type of a C, CEO versus C, e, COO. You right. have to have the same value system, but you're going to be operating in different ways. So yep. that's really good. And so you, you talked a little bit about King of Peace and King of Glory. What were the other ones? King, There's two kings of glory. Yes, and then kings of righteousness. And kings of righteousness. So who is an example of a king of righteousness? David. I was going to say. Is that David? <laughs> awesome. Okay, so so what distinguishes that? What is the distinctions? Of yeah, the kings, king of righteousness? Of, kings of righteousness, they're like lions. Um, you know, all, these kingship archetypes, I connect them to the four faces of the living beings that were around God's throne. Um, oh, wow. you, know, you have the lion, the ox, the eagle, the man. Yeah. Um, I believe that the reason we have those four faces or those beings around God's throne is because our father is a king of kings. He's an emperor and, and he embodies all four archetypes of kings. And so those princes or those beings around him uh, represent what he embodies, the, the personalities and so forth. Mm -hmm. But um, 
you have kings of righteousness. They're, they're like lions. So I think about, you know, how lions tend to patrol their, their, their territory. So the, these kings are very territorial. And the way that they go about their business is they go around taking over territories. That's what they do. So practically speaking, that looks like uh, acquiring businesses that already exist, you know, acquisitions. Um, and then there are some who don't acquire businesses by actually buying them. There's some who do that through legal means. So they're, it's, it's all about taking over businesses. Adam, um, that kingship archetype comes from the spiritual lineage of Adam. So you think about Adam, he didn't start a business from scratch. What he did was he took over a business that already existed. God said, I'm going to put this man over my business. And so he put him over Eden, right? Um, unlike kings of righteousness who basically just come and take over businesses that already exist, mm -hmm. kings of peace build from scratch. So that's where you have Noah's lineage. Noah had to build from scratch. So these kings are builders. They're inventors. They're, they're the guys that are super creative. Um, kings of glory, they're more of the innovators. So you think about Abraham, that's Abraham's lineage. Um, that's also where you have Melchizedek. And, and another thing is, as you, so it starts with kings of righteousness, kings of peace, and then kings of glory. Kings of glory are a combination of the other two kingship archetypes. So Melchizedek, the Bible says, is a king of peace and a king of righteousness. The reason is because he is actually a king of glory. He embodies those two archetypes. And these kings are very innovative. They're, they're all about monetizing. I mean, you would have a king of peace that creates this invention, but all it is is an invention. It's just something that you build, whether it's an app or whatever. But where kings of glory come in is they take that invention and they monetize it. They add value to it and they monetize it and use it, use whatever they get from it to build generational wealth. So I think about Joseph. Joseph was a king of glory. Well, a prince of glory <laughs> under a, working with a king of glory. And you think about what he did. He was all about building generational wealth. So uh, these are the distinguishing, some of the distinguishing factors between the archetypes. That's really, really good. So so how, how would one kind of like, what questions should we ask ourselves to get to understand more about how we're wired? Yep. And so therefore we can set ourselves up and try to operate according to the way that we were designed rather than I want to be an Elon Musk. And so therefore, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm always about what's on your scroll. What's the yeah. race that you're running? So how are we wired? So what questions do we need to ask to find out how we're wired to operate correctly? That is an excellent question. I love it. Um, <laughs> the reason I love it is because answering those. So I came up with what I call the 10 touch points of commitment. Okay. <laughs> so <Awesome. laughs> these are 10 questions that can help us narrow everything down, that, that can help us test our commitment to whatever it is that we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> the, it starts in what I call the priesthood. So these are, I call them priesthood questions and the questions of why and where. So in the Bible, we have these different terms that uh, oftentimes we overlook. You know, the Bible speaks of one baptism, one faith, one Lord, one hope, one heart, one so I mean, these are seven, but then these seven are connected to these 10 touch points. So when I'm starting, when I'm mentoring people, whether it's in business or in leadership or whatever, one of the, the first questions I ask them is, what is your why, right? What is, what is your motivate? What drives you, <laughs> right? What drives you? What, what is, yep. why are you on earth? You know, there are these why questions that I ask. And then I ask the question, what is your where? Where are you going? Yep. You know, Abraham began his journey with those two questions at heart. God said, I am taking you to this land and there I will make you a father of nations. I will bless you, multiply you, and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So God started him with those two questions and or he started him by answering those two questions for him. This is where I'm taking you and this is your why. I'm taking you there because that's where this is going to happen. And so that why becomes the driving force behind everything that we do. And then the third question in that uh, first phase is, who are you? 
<laughs> right? And who are you called to, to cover? And then the next phase is where I get into three other questions. The first is, what is your what? And by what, I'm talking about your strategy. What strategy are you going to use to get to that place that you're going to or to mm -hmm. do whatever it is that you feel that you're supposed to be doing? So yeah. talk about strategy, business models, and so forth. Yep. And then the next question is, what is the cost? Because Jesus said, whoever is going to go to war has to first of all count the cost, <laughs> right? Absolutely, exactly, so, yep. <laughs> so as you, what happens, and then the third question is, what is your, I mean, who? So it's, if we go back to the question of who. So it's four levels, but mm -hmm. every, at every level, we answer that question of who, like, who are you? Who are you called to serve? And the yep. first level, it's who are you called to cover as a priest? And the second uh, phase, it's who are you called to serve? as a servant of God. And the third, who are you, who are you called or what are you called to govern? I mean, who are you called, sorry, who are you called to leave a legacy for? And then in the fourth uh, phase, it's just who are you? And so the third, the, the second phase is your what and answering the question of cost. And then the, the third phase, what we do is we answer the question of your how, like what processes, what systems need to be yep. in place for you to get to wherever it is that you're going to and finally the way so whose legacy are you trying to emulate or imitate and what legacy are you going to leave to live to, to uh leave behind so we answer these questions and what i encourage people to do as we answer these questions is to engage the seven spirits of god because each of those seven spirits answer one of those questions you know, wisdom answers the question of the way. Understanding answers the question of the how. Counsel uh, answers the question of the what. Well, let me let me rephrase that. They help, they guide us in answering those questions, <laughs> right? Right, um, right. Might answers the question of measures, like what is the cost? Uh, knowledge answers the question of the why. And the fear of the Lord answers the helps answer guides us in answering the question of the where, and then of course the Spirit of the Lord is the one who helps, uh, who guides us in answering the question of the who. So these are these are the touch points that are important in helping us discover our kingship archetype, how we're wired, and helping us to refine our vision. And what typically happens is by the time we get to like the second third uh, phase of that you know, session or whatever, it's like, I don't know if I really want to do this, <laughs> you know, because you, can't, you, you think about the cost and you go, man, I don't know if I really want to pay that price. Exactly. And there's a, it's a big responsibility. It really is. You're taking on a lot. So yeah. It, okay. So I just need to, uh, two things come to me. My, I know my audience is sitting there going, where can I get this? So, um, Tell us where, and I'll make sure I put it in the show notes. Sure. I, I do uh, business coaching. I do one-on-one, -on -one, and in my business coaching, uh, it's one-on-one. -on -one. I do one-on-one -on -one mentoring as well, and I also uh -huh. do group mentoring. Um, you can find that on my Patreon site. It's uh, patreon.com slash school of mastery. School of mastery. Okay, yeah. perfect. And I will make sure it's in the show notes. Thank and then you. my second, yeah, of course. Um my second question then is, how did you arrive at which of the seven spirits help with which area? Um, personal <laughs> relationship. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I went through a process um, a couple of years ago where I had to sit, the father required me to sit under the tutelage of all seven spirits. And so during the, during the course of that process, I had to, I mean, a lot of things were, a lot of things happened, but for me, I'm always trying to take the things that I've learned, the things that I've gained and putting it into a framework that allows me to share with others mm -hmm. and provide them with some language that can help them in their process as well. Yes. You're a brilliant teacher. Thank you. Really brilliant. Yes. Okay. So I, I personal, personal experience. So 
let's build a bridge here because there might be people in the audience who haven't stepped into that um, personal relationship with the seven spirits yet. So would you mind giving a little bit of foundational about, um, well, first of all, what are the seven spirits? Uh, uh, not, not huge, but just a little, just so sure. that we can build a little bit of a bridge so I can understand at least what we're talking about. Yeah, in Galatians, I believe it's chapter four, the Bible says that a the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a servant, but is put on the tutors and governors until the appointed time. So, excuse me, the seven spirits of God are lords who function in paternal or maternal roles to help bring us to maturity. And, and they are like just facets of his personality. We're not talking about multiple other gods. We're talking about Yahweh, God, the father. It's just, he has, wears different hats, like has different names that, that um, signify that um, characteristic, right? Yes. Yeah. So our, our father, uh, you know, you think about it, they're called the seven spirits of God. These are spirits that manifest who he is that you know his characteristics and so forth yeah okay yeah awesome and so each of them also have you know like in let's just wisdom wisdom is a really really obvious one because it, she is all over proverbs right if you're in business you need to be reading proverbs you need to be making a relationship building a relationship uh, with wisdom it literally says get wisdom build a relationship with wisdom yep. get understanding is another spirit and they go hand in hand you know get counsel use many counsels so it's right there in in the bible and um, i just don't want to freak anybody out about <laughs> building those relationships but it's brilliant that you were able to tie them to each of those uh touch points yeah 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 um, and, and it's it's fascinating i mean I, I did say personal relationship but one of the things i try to do is that everything i teach i have to have biblical reference for it and so yeah. there are scriptures that point to the fact that these spirits answer specific questions. And it's not like wisdom cannot answer any other type of question, but it's that oftentimes that is the focus. You know, she tackles the way, right? Mm -hmm. And helps answer the question about the way. Um, and, and there are scriptures to back that up. You know, think about counsel. Even just the name counsel speaks to strategy. You mm -hmm. know, have, um, receiving advice or strategy about matters. So yeah, they, all of this stuff is actually in scripture. Yeah, that is yeah. so good. And that's so important because I'm sure, yeah, I think we've had this conversation where this, this stepping into the kingdom age and uh, into mysticism, if you will, but we really have to have our guardrails up as far as not getting off into some stuff that's not of God. Right. And so I really want to um, let let the peeps know that uh, we're not talking about anything like that's based in Kabbalah or New Age no. or anything like that. This is biblically based and it yeah. comes from just pressing into the father. And and one of my one of my peeps said something interesting when when we when i and the people i was with at the moment and actually most of my shows are on kingdom talks media so i can say this is gil and gil and adina when we were stepping into understanding what it looked like from the heaven realms one of the very first things that we have we we switched was visualizing prayer because we always think about hearing from the Lord or in the past, we have always thought, you know, well, I'm going to talk and he's going to talk back. But as soon as we put that piece in, and it was okay to use your imagination and use that muscle that he gave us to connect to the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. Now we're visualizing the prayer. So yeah. now when you're talking about just pressing into understanding these seven spirits, we can literally envision 
sitting with them and having them having a dialogue with us. And it's so helpful in our business. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, Lamuel, it's been just transformational for, for me and for my clients to be able to step into that, that heavenly realm. And, and I, I have been in a business complex in the heavenly realm and I, you know, kind of take people there and we check out their trading floor, which is their office space. And, and mine has a roller coaster in it. Thank you very much. And <laughs> I've got to have a great break room, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> Love and it. anyway, yeah, and so we just develop these relationships with the beings who can help us in our business, because God says he gives us the power to give wealth. Well, that, that power includes a lot of stuff, and there's a whole bunch of other scriptures that, like I said, I only know enough to be dangerous on, yeah. but I have also had that personal relationship that I can, I know my daddy, and he, I know my CEO, you know, and I know my judge when I do step out of line and I, and I have those guardrails up and I just want to encourage all of you guys to do the same, yeah. but yeah. So, oh my gosh, Lamal, this has been so good. I don't, I, I almost don't want to stop the conversation, but I'm looking at the time and going, good <laughs> goodness, we are almost out. But is there anything else that Holy Spirit is talking to you right now? Or you really just really want to share? anything. Yeah, I just want to circle back to what you were saying. I think you, you, you made a very profound point about imagination. Um, hmm. The word meditate, one of, one of the translations of that word or usages of that word throughout scripture is imagine. Um, and so just for, for the audience, it's, it's totally fine to meditate on the word of God. In other words, it's totally fine to imagine the word of God. <laughs> You know, he calls us to, he tells us to do it. Exactly. You know, Jesus says that in Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice. Well, if he stands at the door and knock, I mean, just think about it. I, I personally, the way that I, when I read stuff, I'm, I'm very visual. So when I'm reading that scripture, I'm imagining that. Yep. And there's a place where we can imagine, or if you will, there's a place we can yield our imagination completely to the Holy Spirit. And then he begins to show us the realities of heaven. And in that place of imagining, say, the seven spirits of God, right, where we're imagining sitting under their tutelage, that's a place where the Holy Spirit, because that's he is the one that we want to guide us. We want Jesus, the Holy Spirit, to guide us into that place. And so, you know, just, just some encouragement that when it comes to these things, we, want, we don't want to be afraid. If you're going through the door of Jesus. The Bible says that he is the way. He said it. He is the way. Yep. If you go through Jesus, um, you you don't have to worry about being deceived because he will guide you into all truth. Brilliant. Yeah. Yes. And it's actually the opposite or not opposite, but it's different than the church teaches because the church teaches that death is the door. You have to die to get to heaven. Yeah. That's what I was taught anyway. Yeah. Yeah, but the Bible clearly says, and Jesus has clearly demonstrated that he is the door. His blood, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. And well, this has just been so good. Audience, didn't you just love him? Make sure that you put a bunch of comments in and tell him how amazing he has been. And definitely go to houseofscrolls.com and check out his stuff. And let me see, is there anything else? I um. I'm going to have to have you back. There's just so much. <laughs> I love that you're, you. oh, you have a podcast. Let's talk about the podcast really quick. Just let people know where they can get that. Sure. It's available on any and almost every uh, major podcast directory, Spotify, iTunes. Um, just type in Ask Lamal. That's brilliant too. I love, I love their podcast. I haven't listened to everything. I haven't quite binge listened yet. But I have listened to a few and they're great. And, and I love the guests that you have on and, and they've been really good. Thank All you. right, you guys, um, this has just been so good. And I so appreciate that you guys are the greatest audience. Uh, I love all of the comments and the encouragement that you guys give me. I so appreciate that. And please continue your prayers for growing the Spirit Center Business Movement. We definitely think that it's very, very important to take territory for the kingdom and do it in a way that's different from the world. 
you know what I think I think I said all the way back at the beginning of the previous episode that um, I just discovered in scripture that Samuel had written down what the kingdom should look like and so I mean other people probably knew this scripture but not me I, I'm a little late to the party I guess but anyway there is a very specific reason if you're called to business and you have this entrepreneurial spirit and you think spirit-centered business sounds like a good thing, there is a reason for that. God is calling you to it. And so take it seriously. Um, dive into all of the things that Lemuel was talking about today as far as those responsibilities and all of those different areas of really taking an, an inventory of how you're wired so that you can operate in the kingship that you're designed to. Because we're each designed a little bit different. And that question, who are you? We didn't go there at all, Emwell, but that's a biggie. That's a biggie. I, I didn't, you know, that could be a whole, uh, you know, year long training as it is. But <laughs> that is a biggie, who are you? And, you know, we all can say we're a beloved child of the king, but really, who did he make you uniquely to be? So, all right. I better just wrap up before I continue forever. <laughs> Gotta land this plane. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you one more time, Lemuel. I so appreciate you being on and you will definitely have to come on again. Sure, I'll be glad to. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And one more time. Oh, forgot to mention this. The, co the, the conference that you're coming up, May uh, 21st. 21st and 22nd. Yeah. Also go to House of Scrolls. No, no, no. Yeah, houseofscrolls.com. Is there a button Flat. there? Blueprint. Blueprint. <laughs> Blueprint. Blueprint. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. And everything will be in the show notes. Make sure you go to spiritcenterbusiness.com and click the podcast button and everything will be in the show notes and you can get it all there. All right, you guys. Until next time, stay spirit-centered. Peace out. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Spirit Centered Business with Berlin Newby. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. The next age of doing business by being spirit-centered is coming together in collaboration, working with spiritual principles and knowing our destiny. Join our tribe at spiritcenteredbusiness.com and we'll catch you on the next broadcast. Peace out.